Take your seat, please. Asseyez-vous. Merci. Et cette, Uh, this session will uh, have as thematic the security industry and the war industry, and uh, the jury will be chaired by uh, Cyn Cynthia McKinney. Cynthia and Cynthia McGuire, we will jointly uh, co chair this session and that's, the next session, too. That's very good. Thank you. Women are more circular than men. Uh, okay, I don't have the... Uh... Okay. I don't have my... Um... Is John Hillary here? Oh, well, what's the name of this? I am looking for the schedule. Yes, in this section, we will actually, it's, um, In this section, we are looking at uh, okay, the security industry and the war industry. And um, this is a particularly interesting aspect as I don't know what is happening in uh, the UK and in Europe, but as the police state tightens in the United States, um, security corporations and of course the war machine, those corporations that constitute the war machine are rolling and they're rolling strong. So this testimony is particularly interesting to me and I'm sure will be impactful on all of us as we consider the state of our democracy the, um, and the security apparatus that rolls as a result of the war industry and the wars. So our first um, uh, witness is John Hillary and I would like to invite Mr. Hillary to come to the stand. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, it's a great pleasure and a privilege for War and Want to be able to address this tribunal here today. Um, War and Want has been very actively involved in exposing corporate complicity in Israel's crimes against the Palestinian people and other people of the region. In the last five years, in 2006, we published a report called Profiting from the Occupation, which was subtitled Corporate Complicity in Israel's Crimes Against the Palestinian People, which is almost word for word what this tribunal is meant to be looking at. And I have a copy to be able to give to each of the jurors um, to share. Um, our most recent report, I believe, was, was shared with you yesterday, called Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions. We have a copy for each of the jurors, one by one, so if I may hand one to, to pass to the left. Um, this is, um, again, germane to today's discussions, but also goes further because it responds to the call from Palestinian civil society to mount a global campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel until it complies with international law. And War on Want, we work very closely with our partners in Palestine who have made that call and before I start my testimony today, I just want to draw attention to the fact 
that one of our partners, Stop the Wall, the grassroots anti-apartheid movement in Palestine, their representative, Jamal Juma, has been denied access to come here today to be able to give evidence to this tribunal. He has been denied that access by the Israelis who locked him up without charge for three months earlier on this year. So I think we need to put on record for this tribunal that the evidence that you will hear today is made the poorer by the absence of Palestinians who have been pre 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 um, uh, precluded. precluded, indeed, yes. from coming here today. My, the focus of my um, testimony is on the military industry, the arms trade, and the security apparatus. And as the chair has already indicated, there can be no more obvious example of direct involvement in the violation of human rights and the violation of international humanitarian law. And Israel is obviously one of the most heavily militarized countries on earth. Israel spends between 7 and 9 percent of its GDP every year on the military. This is far and away higher than any other OECD country. The USA, which we consider to be a highly militarized society, spends only 4 percent in comparison. Britain and France, 2.5 percent. Germany, 1.5 percent. So you can see that um, Israel is heavily militarized as a society. In 2009, the Israeli state spent 13.5 billion US dollars on military expenditure, including 2.5 billion from the US itself in military aid. And also, although I cannot touch on it in this, in this presentation, we know that Israel is the only state in the Middle East to have its own nuclear arsenal. And so when we're thinking about corporate complicity, although we do not know any of the details of how big that arsenal is or who has helped in its creation, I feel we need again to put on the record that behind all of the talk here is a nuclear capability which is truly frightening for the whole region. Also by way of context, we tend to speak in terms of exports and imports of arms. War on Want is one of the organizations involved calling for a two-way arms embargo. We helped found a group called Stop Arming Israel, calling for a two-way arms embargo. And that highlights the fact that this is not the case as it is perhaps with Burma or Colombia, where you are trying to stop arms exports to the country, but that actually Israel has its own highly developed arms industry. And indeed that the Israeli companies who are involved in the production of military materiel are very highly developed and connected in the global arms sector. And it's a very complex web of corporate complicity where you have one fighter plane which will be equipped by many different companies providing different components and different systems. It will be carrying different missiles which again have been made by three or four or five different companies and all of them are interconnected. Many of them exist as subsidiaries of each other. So it's a very rich and complex web of complicity that we're talking about here. And that means on the one hand, I will only be able to touch on the very, very top, top level of this and I know I'm going to be supported by presentations to come. But on the other hand, it is an extremely important part of the global movement of trying to find out which companies are complicit in Israel's crimes because it then gives a much greater sense of following up on that with action thereafter. So just to take the top points of this sector, Israel has a very developed military sector as I have said. It's a key part of its economy responsible for over six billion dollars in sales in 2009 alone. And the, the biggest companies have become world players. Elbit, a vast private company now within Israel, um, has subsidiaries in the UK, Austria, the USA, Brazil, Germany, etc., etc. I will not presume to take too much of your time on Elbit because I know that there is a separate presentation on Elbit coming up immediately afterwards. Rafael is another of the biggest Israeli companies, again with a huge order catalog across the world. It has apparently three billion dollars in orders which it's still trying to honor to, to its foreign um, customers. And then the two state-owned giants, 
Israel Military Industries, which is responsible for having developed the Uzi submachine gun, and the Israel Aerospace Industries. These companies occupy the high technology end of the market. And again, I cannot begin to give you a sense of the full breadth of where they currently exist in the market, but I can focus on one particular item which Israeli companies have claimed almost as their own. And these are the unmanned aerial vehicles, the UAVs, which we commonly perhaps know as drones. And drones being used in more and more of the conflicts around the world. We think of them in Pakistan, responsible for numerous civilian casualties there, and have become part of what we would see as the most indiscriminate weaponry. Studies have shown that when you use these unmanned aerial vehicles, which are remote control from miles and miles and miles away, they have a kill ratio to collateral damage ratio, if you'll excuse the horrific parlance, um, of 1 to 10. That means for every one of the people you're targeting to kill with one of these drones, you are likely to kill 10 civilians at the same time. And they are therefore one of the most damaging and most indiscriminate forms of weaponry. They are one of the forms of weaponry which Israeli companies have developed in their use in terms of, of, of the operations in Gaza, in Lebanon in 2006, and also in other operations around the region. We think also of the Israeli air attacks on Syria in 2007. And Elbit has developed its own armory of these different UAVs. The British Army itself has contracted Elbit and its partner company, Thales UK, in a contract worth over $1 billion to develop the next generation of our own British drones, the Watchkeeper drones. And Elbert and Thales are working in a joint venture called UTAX, and the British company, UAV Engines Limited, will produce the plane's engines. But just as you think you're beginning to get the understanding of different parts of these planes being produced by different countries, arms industry, Elbit is in fact the whole owner of the British company UAV Engines Limited. So you have this circular spiral, this complex web I was referring to earlier of different companies from different countries which are still all interconnected. The French arms company Sagam has also signed in for a joint venture with Elbit to produce UAVs. And again, the French drones, the French UAVs have themselves in the past been armed with spike guided missiles from the other major private Israeli arms company, Rafael. So again, you see that type of web. In fact, other countries, Australia, Canada, Croatia, Georgia, Mexico, Singapore, Sweden, and the USA have all contracted to have UAVs from Elbit. Russia, on the other hand, was unhappy with the fact that Elbit had gone into business with Georgia and therefore refuses to give its contracts to Elbit and instead has contracted with Aeronautics Defense Systems, another Israeli company which specializes in UAVs, and also in its most recent order, just last month, Russia contracted for $400 million worth of UAVs from the state-owned company Israel Aerospace Industries. That just gives you a taste of it. And, and the latest development is a new project at the European level from Oparus, as it's called, which involves the British company's BAE systems, the French Sagem and Thales, the Dutch EADS, and Israel Aerospace Industries in a multi-billion dollar project to develop the next generation of pan-European UAVs. And we, the European taxpayer, are kindly paying 12 million euros in EU funding for that project. The same systems, the same statements could be made in respect of many other sectors, tanks, anti-tank missiles, etc. But I will pass on because the other side of the question is, of course, the direct sales from European and US companies into Israel. So Israeli imports of weaponry as well. And once again, Israel is a major player. It is the third largest buyer of combat aircraft in the world after India and the United Arab Emirates last year. And in terms of the European connection, between 2003 and 2008, EU member states approved over a billion euros of arms sales to Israel. 
This is particularly from countries such as France, Germany, Britain, Belgium, Poland, Romania and the Czech Republic. And Finland has become the second largest supplier of missile technology to Israel after the USA, with companies such as Insta Deftech and Patria now in active relationships with Elbit and Raphael. But it is US companies which still far and away represents the most active uh, contracts with Israel. Lockheed Martin, for example, has delivered 52 F-16 aircraft to Israel over the last five years. The F-16 fighter aircraft, which are used in almost all of the assaults on Lebanon, Gaza, and other Palestinian entities around in, in, this, in the area. And indeed, Israel has signed up to receive the new F-35 fighter aircraft as the first country to be given U.S. military aid to that program. The F-35 is now being developed with Northrop Grumman, with the British company BA Systems. The engines are being supplied by the U.S. company Pratt & Whitney and also by Rolls-Royce. Again, every time you press on this, you uncover a rich web of corporate complicity. Boeing boasts on its own website that it has been involved in providing the Israeli Air Force with fighter planes since its creation in 1948. Um, the Mustang fighter planes which were used in the invasion of Egypt in 1956 and indeed now the Apache AH-64 helicopters. And once again it is British firms which are providing some of the components used in those helicopters. For example the British firm Bremar provides the display components for the Apache helicopters. And Boeing is de developing its own relationships with Israel Aerospace Industries, Israel Military Industries, Elbit, Raphael, Radar Electronics, etc., etc. Raytheon, again the world's biggest missile producer from the USA, has long been a major supplier to Israel. It provides the, the laser-guided bunker-busting missiles which were used in Lebanon in 2006 to such murderous extent. And once again, EDO in Sussex, EDO, which has been the target of much public action here, provides the components, the release mechanisms for these bombs for Raytheon. But EDO itself is wholly owned by ITT, which is the US arms company. So once again, you have to follow the money through this entire system. And I don't want again to tr take too long on another company which is going to be dealt with later, but Caterpillar, on which we also produced a report five years ago from War on Want, um, has been egregiously involved in its production of armored militarized bulldozers which have been used in Palestinian house demolitions um, throughout the process of the occupation. Two more minutes. I will not therefore touch on the other sides of the Israeli military sector, which are the private military and security companies, a massive, a massive part of Israel's military and security apparatus, or the surveillance which has been used and exported around the world. If you came here by underground this morning, you'll be glad to know that London Underground purchased from Verint, the Israeli security company, the technology which is used to see people down in the tube. But of course, that is technology which has been developed in the context of the wall and security apparatus in Israel and the occupied territories. Pardon me. But my final thing. Do you have, do you have uh, that information that you're skipping over available to us? It's, that is uh, all either in the document which I have passed you along now or also in the written statement which we have submitted to you already. Okay. So, for example, the letter which we sent to the United Nations and working group on mercenaries that identifies the 35 private military and security companies of Israel. Thank you. But my final point, Madam Chair, is on the issue of complicity itself. As activists who've been involved in exposing corporate complicity, we are familiar with the three categories of corporate complicity which are commonly postulated by legal experts. The idea of silent complicity, where a company will stand idly by while crimes are being committed in the area where it is working. The idea of beneficial complicity, where a company directly benefits from human rights crimes, even if it is not directly involved itself. And then, of course, direct complicity, 
where the companies themselves are supplying the material and the wherewithal to commit the crimes. It's quite clear that in respect of the military apparatus, we're talking about direct complicity. And I refer you to a quote from the former UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food, Jean Ziegler, when he was writing to the chief executive of Caterpillar in 2004, he said, I am bringing this to your attention because of the complicity of your company, because you supply the material in the certain knowledge, quote unquote, in the certain knowledge that they will be used against civilian targets in Palestine. I want to conclude by adding a fourth category to these three categories of corporate complicity, and that is actively marketed complicity, because the Israeli and other companies involved in producing the military material which has been used in Gaza, in Lebanon, in Syria, actively boast that they have provided the material for these crimes to take place. Elbit has sold its Skylark UAV on the understanding that it was supremely successful in the murderous assault on Lebanon. Similarly, the Hermes UAV, which we used in Operation Cast Lead against the people of Gaza. And Boeing also has tried to promote its material on the understanding that it has been used. It has been road tested on Palestinian and Lebanese civilians. That is why we would move that this is perhaps the most extreme form of direct complicity in crimes against the Palestinian people and other peoples of the region, but also why it is one of the most productive areas where we as citizens can move together to challenge the companies which have allowed Israel to get away with these murderous crimes for so long. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, chilling testimony. Um, I will defer to my co-chair if she has questions. Mairead. Um, thank you very much indeed. Well, it just brings home to us all those statistics of how hard our job is going to be in moving from military mindsets and trying to solve our problems in more civilized ways. Um, it is scary to think that we all regard America as being the leading military uh, industrial complex in the world. And when we look at Israel, uh, seven to nine percent of its GT GDP spent on militarism. I mean, how do we get home? I would like to ask this question. How do we get home to the fact that Israel is, has nuclear weapons, is one of the most advanced weapon world, uh, systems in the world? Um, how do we get home to ordinary people and mobilize them? Because this is a people's movement will have to do this. Governments will not do this. People have to do this. How do we get home to people that they have to take responsibility and act to start uh, ma uh, making Israel uphold its international and human rights and start uh, solving its problems through dialogue and negotiation because militarism won't work? I'm thinking of the fact that um, the ordinary civilian in Europe's tax and in America and in other countries goes to upholding the military occupation of Israel in the West Bank. I participated in a peace march in Ramallah in the West Bank and took a plastic bullet in the hip, which still causes me pain. And I feel that who paid for that and who pays for the military occupation and the repression by Israel of the people of Palestine? It comes back to the fact it's our taxpayers. It comes back to the fact that human international community has to operate on this. How can we, as, a, uh, as the Russell Tribunal, how can people bring more pressure on the Israeli government and corporations who are complicit in war crimes and doing this, how can we help and, and bring a new consciousness that we all have to do something to end this occupation? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say, Madam Chair, that there is a very ready answer to that question. And I think that the boycott, divestment, sanctions call is precisely honed in on this empowerment of people to see 
where their money is being used and where it is being used to commit crimes. But the good news is it is one of the areas where we have already seen significant movement. The General Synod of the Church of England, for example, voted two years ago to withdraw all of its investments from Caterpillar, and all of those investments have now been in withdrawn. As we know, the Norwegian Government Pension Fund announced its divestment from Elbit, the Danish bank followed suit, the Dutch pensions companies followed suit. There has been direct action taken against Raytheon and Edo in this country alone, where juries have acquitted all of those responsible for hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of criminal damage because they recognized that they were acting in the higher good. So I feel we are already on the way to making a great difference here and that by giving more people the, the material to know what's behind the call for boycott, divestment and sanctions, that will actually take the movement to its next stage. Thank you, Mr. Hillary. Are there any more questions I should have asked before? Thank you. We are severely pressed for time. Um, our next presenter is uh, Maria LaHood. Hello. Thank you to the Tribunal for inviting me to testify. I am an attorney with the Center for Constitutional Rights. Since 1967, Israel has destroyed nearly 25,000 Palestinian structures in the occupied Palestinian territory. Since that same year, Caterpillar Inc., which is headquartered in Peoria, Illinois, in the United States, has been supplying bulldozers to Israel that have been used in those demolitions. Human rights organizations began to condemn the home demolitions at least as early as 1989, and more widely by 1999. At least by 2001, Caterpillar was specifically notified that it was aiding and abetting violations of international law by providing Israel with the bulldozers used to destroy homes. Caterpillar has nonetheless continued to sell D9 bulldozers to Israel, knowing they would be used to unlawfully demolish homes in the occupied Palestinian territory. In 2001, a spokesperson from CAT said, Caterpillar does not base sales on customers' intended use for its products. Since then, CEO Jim Owens has made similar statements about not being able to monitor the use, or the use of its equipment. The Caterpillar, the Caterpillar D9 bulldozer is over 13 feet tall and 26 feet wide and weighs more than 60 tons with its armored plating and can demolish a house in minutes. House demolitions have forcibly displaced more than 50,000 Palestinians and have killed people as well. In 2002, when the IDF launched attacks on Nablus and Janine in the West Bank, the Al Shobi family was at their home in the old city of Nablus when it was destroyed by a caterpillar bulldozer without warning in the middle of the night. Samir and his pregnant wife, Nabila, and their three young children, as well as Samir's father and his two sisters, were all killed. A few days later, in an incursion into the Janine refugee camp, the IDF destroyed at least 140 buildings and severely damaged 200 more rendering 4,000 people homeless. Jamal Fayed, who was paralyzed, was unable to leave his home. Jamal's father and sister alerted the bulldozer driver and tried to stop him, but he demolished it anyway, killing Jamal. In Rafah, there were 1,600 home demolitions between September 2000 and 2004 along the southern strip of, of Gaza. In September 2002, a bulldozer demolished the Abu Hussein family's home about 150 meters from where Israel was constructing the wall and a so-called buffer zone around it. The destruction began without warning at approximately 5 in the morning, injuring the family inside. About six months later and about 200 meters away, Rachel Corey stood in front of the home of the Nasrallah family, where she had previously stayed, to protect it from demolition by a Caterpillar D9 bulldozer while the family was inside. The IDF soldier operating the bulldozer ran over her and then backed up over her again, killing her. In a July 2004 incursion into the Khan Yunus refugee camp in Gaza, the IDF demolished over 70 homes. Just after midnight, a bulldozer approached the Kalafala's home, where Ibrahim Kalafala was inside. He's in his 70s and was sick and unable to move. When the bulldozer hit the house, his wife and daughter tried to get the bulldozer to stop, but he continued destroying their home and killing Mr. Kalafala. In 2005, the Center for Constitutional Rights and co-counsel brought a case against Caterpillar on behalf of those families in the United States District Court. Pursuant to the Alien Tort Statute mentioned yesterday, 
The case asserted customary inter international law claims that Caterpillar aided and abetted Israel's war crimes, including collective punishment, the destruction of property not justified by military necessity, and attacks against civilians. Caterpillar aided and abetted war crimes by knowingly providing assistance that had a substantial effect on their commission by the IDF. CAT continued to provide D-9 bulldozers to Israel, knowing they had been and would be used to unlawfully demolish homes in the occupied Palestinian territory. And it was foreseeable that civilians would be harmed as well. Claims were also brought for cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, and for extrajudicial killing, both under the ATS and the Torture Victim Protection Act, in addition to other federal and state claims. In the proceedings, CAT submitted a letter from 2001 from the U.S. government to Israel, granting funding approval for a prior contract for the sale of 50 D-9 bulldozers from Caterpillar to Israel. CAT's GM of Defense and Federal Products submitted an affidavit asserting that all sales of D-9 bulldozers since at least 1990 re received the similar U.S. government approvals. The district court dismissed the case on numerous grounds without having oral argument and without permitting discovery or the exchange of, of evidence. The court found the company could not be liable for selling its products knowing they would assist war crimes unless it actually intended that the war crimes be committed. The military necessity could, is subjective, so it could not be part of a specific customary international law norm. That the Torture Victim Protection Act does not apply to corporations that exhaustion of remedies was required in Israel, that the case interfered with U.S. foreign policy, and that the case uh, interfered with a foreign sovereign's acts of state. On appeal, the United States government submitted a brief asserting that it had paid for the bulldozers at issue and arguing that the case would interfere with foreign policy because the U.S. government had made a determination to extend foreign military financing to Israel and to encourage equipment manufacturers like Caterpillar to sell its goods to foreign states receiving such funds. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which governs the western part of the United States, did not rule on the merits of the case, but found that it did not have jurisdiction to decide the case because adjudication would intrude upon the U.S. executive's foreign policy decisions. The family sought rehearing, which was denied last year, thereby ending the case against Caterpillar in U.S. courts. Since then, as mentioned yesterday, the Second Circuit, which governs the New York area, has found that defendants must have acted with a purpose to advance a government's human rights abuses in order to be liable for aiding and abetting. Knowledge is not sufficient. The Supreme Court refused to hear that case. The Second, the Second Circuit has also found that there is no corporate liability under customary international law and therefore under the ATS. A petition for rehearing is pending in that case, but other courts have unfortunately started to follow that decision. In a case CCR has against private military contractors of the, United States, of the United States who tortured detainees in Iraq, the DC Circuit found non-state actors cannot be liable for war crimes and that federal law preempts any state law claims. The Supreme Court has asked the United States government to weigh in on whether it should hear the case. In another case showing deference to the United States government, the Second Circuit granted immunity to Israeli official Avi Dichter in a case we brought against him for dropping a one-ton bomb on a residential apartment building in Gaza, killing 15 civilians, a so-called targeted killing. The court deferred to the U.S. government's suggestion that Dichter had common law immunity for his so-called official acts. Rachel Corey's parents continue to pursue accountability against Israel and the Israeli courts. The trial in Haifa has vividly exposed how the Israeli investigation following Rachel's killing was not thorough, credible, or transparent. For example, an Israeli military police investigator testified that he never visited the site of Rachel's killing and never looked at the video footage, and that the commander of the unit who was uh, involved in killing Rachel interrupted his investigation and told the bulldozer driver that Doran Almog, head of the IDF Southern Command, ordered him to stop talking, not to sign anything, and not to cooperate with the investigation. As far as the continuation of home demolitions, ICAD has reported that there were 4,455 military demolitions last year alone. The Goldstone Report found that not only houses, but orchards, a chicken coop, concrete packaging plant, and more were bulldozed during Operation Cast Lead evidently by armored D-9 bulldozers. 
Just yesterday, it was announced that Israel has ordered the demolition of 88 Palestinian homes in East Jerusalem. Although the case against Caterpillar lost in the courts, it did raise awareness, provided opportunities to mobilize around, and reveal more information about the U.S. government's role. Josh Rubner will be talking after me about the campaign against Caterpillar and the U.S. role and responsibility regarding the D9 bulldozers and aid to Israel in general. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Mr. Duga. Yes, Mr. Hood. I, I would like to ask a question about the uh, Caterpillar bulldozer itself. There's evidence that Thank you. Uh, Caterpillar itself has installed an extra uh, hook onto the machine in order to facilitate the destruction of uh, roads and infrastructure such as uh, water pipes and electricity uh, wires. Do, do you have any evidence about such an installation of an extra uh, hook? I, I have heard about that, but I don't actually have any evidence of that. Um, and there's also, you know, some information that even the armored plating and the uh, bulletproof cabin um, are installed elsewhere, possibly in Israel, for, for some of the bulldozers. So I don't know about specifically about the hook. Thank you. Madam Co-Chair, did you have some questions? Um, I have myself stood in a Palestinian home that was uh, being bulldozed and got my feet rather full of, uh, of, of sand, 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 sand dust. Uh, we went to visit the mayor in Jerusalem to talk about demolition of Palestinian homes. We were with the rabbis for human rights and against the demolition of Palestinian homes, whose work is very inspirational to all of us. But the mayor denied they were actually demolishing Palestinian homes. Could you tell us here as a jury why Palestinians uh, build their homes and they get demolished, why they build them again and they, and they get demolished and they build them again? Why do Palestinians do this? Um, uh, 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 what is the situation with regard to them actually being given permits to do this? Could you go on a little bit more as to why the background to this? Well, there are, I mean, I, I, think, I think they do it because of, of persistence and hope. Um, there are different kinds of demolitions. There are demolitions uh, purportedly that are punitive, which are a small percent of the demolitions. There are so-called administrative de demolitions for, for purportedly a lack of permits, but they're not able to get, Palestinians aren't able to get permits to build their home. Um, much of that is just, again, the, the taking of land. Uh, and then there are the military demolitions, um, or the so-called military demolitions, whether it's for building the wall, um, whether it's for just operations or whether it's just collective punishment. Um, and those are the types that, that we dealt with in the case. Thank are you there, very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Thanks. I, I just want to go back um, to the question of the armaments industry in America or mm -hmm. Israel that is in partnership with Caterpillar. You made reference to the additional equipment and are you aware of which armaments or security company Caterpillar is in partnership with, or is Caterpillar producing its own additional security equipment? I think they are in partnership with other, with other countries as well, and they have distributors. Can you name those? I, I cannot name those. I mean, there's, you know, as far as the armored plating, there is actually an Israeli company, IMI, that, that does some of the, that we understand, does some of the, um, no. add some of the armored plating. Um, but as far as other countries, um, I, I don't know. I've heard some Euro European oh. countries, but we don't have certain evidence. But this is obviously open to further research. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And there could be jurisdiction in other yeah. countries yeah. if either the armored plating is put there, if the, if the bulldozers may be manufactured or shipped from there. Um, yeah. There could be, that could be something no, to thank look into. You. I'm told that Mr. Hillary has the answer to your question. Now or later? Well, Do you want it now? Might as well, Mr. Hillary. <laughs> You've conquered Everest, so let's hear this one. <laughs> <laughs> he 
had, he had two L's to his name, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> yes, it is indeed, as, as, as we've just been heard, it is um, certainly within Israel itself, Israel Aerospace Industries is also involved, I believe, in the militarization of the Caterpillar D9 bulldozer. We also have companies here in the UK who are subsidiaries of Caterpillar who are involved in producing that. I will certainly happily give the, the um, Tribunal Jury a copy of the Caterpillar report we have, which also goes to the um, question asked by Professor Dugard. We have a nice picture of the D9 bulldozer with its hook specifically added, which is, as you say, designed to be able to rip up water infrastructure and things like this. So maybe if I can leave these two copies with the tribunal. Julie. Thank you. Are there any more questions for Ms. LaHood? Well, I have one question, and that is, are the various CCR briefs available online? Yes. If you go to ccrjustice.org and search Caterpillar, all our briefing is there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, we will now hear from Josh Rubner. Good afternoon, distinguished jury members. Thank you very much for this opportunity to address you. I'm Josh Rubner, the National Advocacy Director for the U.S. Campaign to End the Israeli Occupation, a national coalition in the United States of more than 300 organizations working to end U.S. support for Israel's illegal 43-year military occupation of the Palestinian West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza Strip, and working to change U.S. policy to support human rights, international law, and equality in Israel-Palestine. We have been organizing a multi-year campaign to both raise awareness about and advocate for an end to U.S. military aid to Israel in general, and a campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Caterpillar in particular. Now, Caterpillar offers us an excellent case study in the effects of U.S. military aid to Israel on Palestinian civilians, which Maria did such an excellent job of articulating. But by no means are the processes and mechanisms and laws which I will describe for the tribunal in regard to the transfer of Caterpillar bulldozers from the United States to Israel, is it unique? It's not unique. In fact, it's the standard operating procedure for how all weapons are transferred to Israel. And is not only the big ticket items that were mentioned by John at the outset of this session. It's the very small yet crucial components of weaponry that sustain and enable Israel's illegal military occupation and human rights abuses of Palestinians, which form such a crucial component of the U.S. military aid package to Israel. According to the Israeli human rights organization, B'Tselem, over the last 10 years, more than half of innocent Palestinians who have been killed by the Israeli military have been killed by small guns and by bullets in a very personal, very intimate way. And the United States literally provides Israel with tens of thousands of these guns every year and hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of the actual bullets every year. What I would like to highlight in my testimony is not only the corporate complicity, but the U.S. governmental complicity in marketing, approving, and financing these weapons transfers to Israel. At every stage of this process, the U.S. government is complicit in the transfer of these weapons. In the United States, the president submits a budget request to Congress. And in his next budget request, which will go to Congress in January or February of this year, President Obama 
will propose a record 3.05, excuse me, 3.075 billion dollars in military aid to Israel, a record level. Congress at every level has the opportunity to amend this budget request, add to it, subtract from it, as Representative McKinney knows from her service in the U.S. Congress. But beyond just the presidential and the congressional approval of this military aid to Israel, there are also opportunities for the executive branch agencies to put a stop to these sales because the Department of State, the equivalent of uh, foreign ministry, approves each and every contract and each and every sales. And the Department of Defense, or the Pentagon, implements the transfer of the weapons. And what we know is that there are myriad opportunities for any one of these institutions to either formally or informally stop the delivery of these weapons if it chooses to do so. And I would say that these institutions must do so according not only to international law and human rights standards, but according to the U.S. domestic law itself. We in the United States have provisions that are supposed to prevent U.S. weapons from being misused to commit human rights abuses anywhere in the world. The Arms Export Control Act states that weapons can be used for one of only two purposes, either for internal security or for legitimate self-defense. And I will leave it to the distinguished members of the jury to determine whether they believe that Israel is using these weapons for internal security or for legitimate self-defense. Beyond that, the Foreign Assistance Act regulates all forms of U.S. aid to Israel. And I quote from it in the written testimony that I provided, but I'll say it here for the benefit of those listening. The Foreign Assistance Act states no assistance may be provided to the government of any country which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. I will again leave it to the members of the distinguished jury to determine whether Israel is indeed guilty of a pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights. According to the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. Since September 2000, Israel has killed more than 3,000 innocent Palestinian civilians who took absolutely no part in hostility. Of those fatalities, 21 were killed in the process of home demolitions, which Maria described, seven of whom were children. The vast majority of these deaths are attributable to the U.S. military aid that is provided to Israel. Now, despite the fact that this military aid is paid for by U.S. taxpayers, information on the corporations involved and the weapons transferred, as Representative McKinney knows from her time in Congress, is a highly guarded state secret which is very, very difficult to unearth. Finding out the corporations that are involved in this process is an extremely opaque process. So to be honest to the distinguished members of the jury, we simply don't know either the total amount or value of Caterpillar bulldozers that have been transferred to Israel over the last 10 years or over any course of years. We do have some estimates based on documents that Caterpillar supplied to the U.S. District Court that Maria spoke about earlier. In 2001, we know that Caterpillar had a contract for 50 of the D9 bulldozers valued at $32.6 million, according to documents supplied by Caterpillar itself. But this may just be the tip of the iceberg. And we have reason to believe that many more 
bulldozers have been transferred at U.S. taxpayer expense. But, and this goes back to something which was said yesterday, validating the importance of these types of public campaigns to put pressure on these corporations and these governments is the fact that we may actually be seeing some forward progress on this campaign finally, as was revealed in the Israeli media just a few weeks ago on October 25th when it was reported that Caterpillar was delaying the delivery of $50 million worth of D9 bulldozers to the Israeli military. Now this is a potential bright spot and I think it's important to point out that Caterpillar sells these bulldozers for business reasons. Uh, they would not hold up a delivery of bulldozers unless the U.S. government forced them to hold up the delivery of these bulldozers and we have been trying very hard to determine exactly what is going on behind the scenes and we're getting one story from Caterpillar another from the Department of Defense, and the third from the State Department. None of them match up. But we do know that something very significant is going on because the State Department has refused to deny the stories that deliveries have been suspended. And when I called to talk to the official in charge of the implementing of the military aid contracts to Israel, he told me, please wait while I check with my superior and he came back five minutes later to say no comments and we will not be able to meet with you to discuss what is going on. International civil society and especially we in the United States have a special responsibility I think to uh, continue and intensify these campaigns to halt the corporate and governmental complicity in arming Israel and allowing these human rights violations to occur. And I would urge the distinguished members of the jury, if they believe that the U.S. government is complicit in arming Israel with these weapons, that it writes to President Obama, that it write to the State Department, that it write to the members of Congress who are responsible for foreign policy and demand that at the very least the U.S hold itself accountable to its own laws such as the Arms Export Control Act and the Foreign Assistance Act and follow the law and make sure that we as taxpayers are no longer responsible and complicit in Israel's human rights abuses. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I wanted to applaud myself. Um, <laughs> thank you, Josh. Um, I just have one question that I'd like to pose to you. Given the rules of the United States Senate and the power of one courageous U.S. Senator to utilize the hold or the filibuster, it is possible that these actions could stop or that U.S. policy could be changed if we had such a U.S. Senator. Could you describe to me, in your opinion, what it would take in order for us to have that kind of U.S. Senator? <laughs> Other than a, a complete <laughs> reconfiguration of campaign finance and uh, how our democracy works or does not work in the United States? Uh, no, it's a fantastic question. Uh, unfortunately, the senator would have to put a hold on the entirety of the budget. Uh, but there are a very few and select number of members of Congress who have the power to make amendments to the budget at the point at which uh, it, it can be amended before it goes to the floor of the Congress and as you know when it gets to the floor of the Congress for a general vote it's it's mainly uh, a pro forma type of thing mm -hmm. but there is a subcommittee and I detail this in my my written testimony a subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee of the House and Senate that looks at the foreign aid budget in detail and those members of Congress would be the ones uh, to address to try to get some changes and accountability 
uh, in terms of practices on military aid to Israel? I think that um, I anticipate the tribunal's uh, final session in the United States where we can explore these kinds of issues more in depth. Madam Co-Chair, do you have any questions? We are already in agreement that Israel is breaking international laws and human rights and has committed war crimes in Gaza. Um, the fact that um, so many companies and that states, including the UK and the European Union and America, are um, supporting and underpinning economically, militarily and in every way the continued war crimes of Israel. Um, it, legally, we have everything that points to this, these war crimes. Uh, how then, if, it, if it's not, if legally these companies and states are not fulfilling their obligation uh, under law, how then do we manage to move them to a different level? What about the question of morality and ethics? Is there something missing that we are not able to move governments and people and the international community to see that this is immoral, what is going on? Is there another way that we touch corporations and governments to actually act and stop remaining silent and complicit in the face of war crimes? Absolutely, and I, I think it's through popular education, popular mobilization. Uh, unfortunately, in the United States, most people are not that concerned about foreign affairs in general, and even with the wars that we are fighting abroad. Uh, most uh, Americans, if they think about political issues, think about the day-to-day -day pocketbook issues that affect them personally. So what we're trying to do is to make the connection between our spending of $30 billion of military aid between 2009 and 2018. That doesn't include President Obama's new pledge of $3 billion additional for uh, 20 more F-35 fighter jets, which is in the press right now. But we're trying to make the connection between this huge expenditure of money and what that same money could buy for affordable housing, for health care, for green jobs training, and for education programs in the United States, all of which are sorely lacking. So we have an interactive website, aidtoisrael.org, where we have information on every city, county, congressional district, and state in the country that details how much of that geographics unit money is going in military aid to Israel and what it could purchase for those much needed domestic issues uh, instead. So I think the answer lies in creating links between movements for accountability and justice on foreign policy on the one hand and uh, social justice movements working domestically on the other and linking those two together in a common struggle. Are there any Thank other you very questions? Much. Thank you. Oh. Any other questions? Josh, I just have one more uh, question. Given the November elections, um, do you see when the new Congress is sworn in in January that your job will be easier or will it be more difficult? I would say on the whole more difficult, uh, although among some of the quote-unquote Tea Party candidates who were elected to the U.S. Congress in November, there is a strong uh, isolationist, strong anti-tax sentiment among them. We'll see if that sentiment also applies to U.S. empire, uh, towards U.S. weapons and military aid programs or not. What's interesting is that the Republican leadership is anticipating this, and Eric Cantor, who is scheduled to be the majority leader of the, of the House of Representatives in the United States, is now saying, and perhaps you know more about the constitutionality of this than I do, but he's trying to pull uh, U.S. military aid to Israel out of the foreign aid budget and put it somewhere else in the U.S. budget to 
insulate it from these anticipated cuts, which I think is very apropos because in many respects uh, Israel is treated as uh, part of the United States in terms of our political discourse uh, and dis discourse around this issue. Uh, we do have one question from Juror Casrills. <coughs> Thanks. Just a, another very short one. It's just the comment uh, and the information you provided on the latest uh, Caterpillar order being held up. Surely the reason for this is just a very simple one related to um, the demand that the settlement freeze, the settlement expansion construction should be frozen for the magnificent length of 90 days. Wouldn't it simply be that? It may be connected to that. Uh, based on the timing when the story broke, I don't think that the Obama administration was in any way wanting to sanction Israel because this was a few days before the uh, election and the last thing that President Obama needed was a uh, debate on whether he is uh, soft on, on supporting Israel. So it's really a, a mystery, quite honestly, what's going on with the halt of deliveries. But there definitely is something going on and we'll continue to try to get to the bottom of it. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, now will we hear from both Dr. Dalit and Merev. Yes. Oh. <laughs> we are here now to present the case of uh, G4S. Uh, group for Securecar. It's a uh, British-Danish company that uh, has uh, extensive operations in, in Israel. Uh, in 2002, the company bought uh, one of Israel's largest uh, uh, private security companies called uh, Hashmira, uh, which was uh, founded and owned by uh, Igal uh, Stressmaster. Uh, and was operating in, uh, extensively in the occupied territory, mainly for uh, uh, guarding, uh, providing uh, guarding services to settlements. Uh, when it was, uh, it was uh, bought in 2002, it was still a group for security, it didn't exist yet, it was uh, called gr uh, Group for Falk, which was just uh, Danish. Um, Currently, uh, in 2004, the company was bought by, uh, uh, was uh, merged with uh, the Securica uh, company, which is a British company, and they became one of the largest uh, security uh, providers uh, internationally. Uh, currently, the company, the uh, uh, group uh, G4S Israel, is uh, owned 90.5 uh, uh, by the Danish-British co uh, company. And the, uh, the, the Israeli company is registered as an Israeli company, but it is uh, fully controlled by uh, the uh, European com uh, company. Three of the, uh, the, the company has three directors, one of the, which is uh, uh, Eagle, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the CEO of the company, uh, and the other two are Andreas Patrikas, which is, who is the uh, regional counselor for uh, South and East Europe, and that evidently includes Israel, and uh, Soren Landsberg Nelson, uh, who is the group uh, general counsel and is responsible for providing the legal services for the entire company. I think that it's an interesting uh, point to note that the, uh, such a company would put its lawyer uh, at the, as the director of its Israeli branch. Um, in, when the company, uh, when the uh, group for Felk uh, uh, took over uh, Hashmira in 2002, uh, the uh, uh, British uh, paper The Guardian exposed the fact that uh, the company was now owning uh, or now providing services to, set, to the settlements. Uh, this uh, stirred, uh, this caused uh, a significant stir and there was uh, uh, a, immediately the company came out with a declaration that you can see there, but the lead will. Yeah. Uh, I'll just read uh, two sentences from the company's uh, declaration following this exposure. 
Um, the main conclusion of the now completed impartial legal assessment is that Hashmira's operations are not per se in breach of current international conventions and international law. Um, uh, but uh, then uh, the company's representative said, if, even, if our even if our investigation clearly indicates that our activity on the West Bank do not entail a breach of human rights, it is not enough for us to be legally in the clear. This is a company's representative. He continues, continues and says, in some situations, there are also other criteria which we must take into consideration. And to avoid any doubt about whether G4, uh, Group 4 FARC respects international conventions and human rights, we have decided to leave the West Bank. Well, this is quite an impressive uh, statement and an impressive uh, action. And uh, as far as we know, they actually uh, complied with this. Uh, we even know that when there was uh, the process of uh, the privatization of the checkpoints uh, in 2000, between 2004 and 2006, uh, Hashmira, which was still the, uh, uh, the, the largest uh, uh, security company, didn't apply for the tenders for uh, providing security personnel to the checkpoints, which we understand is indicating that the company was staying away from uh, such contro controversial projects. Uh, however, uh, when we started our uh, uh, research of uh, 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 companies operating in, in the West Bank, we did find, uh, where's the remote yeah. control? Oh. We found this, this picture, oops, yes. It's, uh, you see the, on the bottom left side, there's a picture of a scanner. And uh, this, is t this was taken in the Kalandia checkpoint, which separates uh, the Ramallah district from East Jerusalem. Uh, we, uh, when we investigate to see who, it, it's a scanner by an American company called RapiScan, and when we investigated in, uh, in search for who was supplying these scanners, we found that it was uh, Hashmira, the, uh, the uh, technologies division of the company. Uh, we, we, just, we then looked further into what else the, the technologies department was doing, and we found that they were, they were pro uh, providing other scanners. These are uh, personal luggage scanners that uh, people walking through the checkpoint have to put their luggage through, but then they provide other scanners, oh, which are called Safe View. They are uh, uh, manufactured by another uh, American company, company called L3, and these rotate around you and produce a full body image of the, uh, the body without clothes. Uh, these uh, scanners are now installed, these and the, uh, the hand luggage scanners are now uh, installed in uh, uh, most of the checkpoints along the separation wall and in the ERES checkpoint. That means that the, uh, the company is, uh, th those checkpoints are, are part of the uh, infrastructure of the wall. It's part of the, uh, that we talked about the wall extensively before. And it's, they're also taking part in the siege over Gaza. Um, we, uh, they are also, the, the checkpoints around Jerusalem are not only part of the wall apparatus, they are also separate, they are inside occupied land, restricting or limiting the, the movement of uh, Palestinian, West Bank Palestinians into the uh, area called uh, East Jerusalem, which is part of the occupied territory. Um, these, uh, we also found that the same division, the technological division of G4S supplies other equipment for other, uh, other installations. For instance, they have, according to their own publications, they have provided security uh, uh, mechanisms for uh, the uh, uh, police station located in E1. E1, I don't know if you know about this area. It's uh, an area between uh, East Jerusalem and the settlement block of uh, Malay Dumim. It's a highly controversial area to the extent the, that the American administration in the Bush era, era uh, 
uh, refused to allow Israel to build in that area. The significance of this area is because it, if, you, if Israel has full control over that area, it completely cuts off the northern and central part of the West Bank, including Nablus, Jenin, and Ramallah, from the southern part of the West Bank of Bethlehem and Hebron. So if this area is, uh, remains in Israeli control, if uh, settlements are built there, then uh, there is no way that there, there's going to be a Palestinian state because there, it's already divided uh, permanently into two areas. Uh, so consequently, the Israelis did not build a settlement in that area, but they did move the headquarters of uh, uh, the regional police station to this, uh, to this area and uh, in that, currently that's all there is. There is, there, are, uh, there, there is only one facility there, and that's the police station, and G4S is supplying uh, the uh, security uh, technology for that, for that station. Um, okay. Let's continue. We started uh, really looking into the activities of this technologies division of this company, and uh, we came upon some of their brochures and uh, I remember picking it up in some uh, exhibition, picking it from uh, an official of the company, and I came back home in the evening and I started flipping through the pages and I came upon this picture on the right. And this means they are boasting about their complicity in this prison. This is the infamous Offer prison. It is a prison located um, in the West Bank. It is dedicated only for Palestinian political prisoners. Um, it is a compound that includes also a military court and um, a military base. It's one of the worst places I've ever visited in. No, this is personal because I've personally witnessed um, teenage kids being brought to the courtroom in offer in shackles after being taken in the middle of the night from their homes and kept in that prison for a whole week, not charged with anything. They were brought there just to testify against their neighbors who were involved in organizing peaceful demonstrations. So they were brought there to testify under pressure uh, uh, that their neighbors were, I don't know, telling them to throw stones or something. This is a a really terrible place. Okay, I cannot really. Uh, um, let me uh, continue. Uh, they provided for this prison uh, a perimeter defense system along the walls of the prison, including a central command room that monitors the entire perimeter. This is G4S's complicity. If you read through that uh, brochure, you see that they actually supplied more equipment to prisons in Israel, inside Green Line. 48 Israel, and that includes three prisons that are mentioned and seen on this map. Uh, one is the uh, Moon prison, the other one is Megiddo, and the third one is uh, Ktiot. And these are the prisons that house Palestinian political prisoners. The vast majority of them are inside Green Line Israel. Uh, currently there are 6,700 such prisoners. Uh, of those there are over 200 minors and 37 women. Uh, political prisoners have very limited rights. They are exposed to torture. You can read the reports of Israeli human rights organizations to learn more about that. Um, moreover, when they are held within Israel, then they are denied the right to, a, a, to be among their community. Palestinians are not allowed into Israel, so the visitation is very limited. In order to visit them, people need at least three permits, and they are dependent on the uh, GSS to get these permits. It's very, very hard to come by. It's very expensive and very difficult. Um, in Ktsiot prison, for example, there is also a branch of the military court, which means that uh, remand hearings and the extension of arrests are held locally inside Israel. Uh, that means, for example, that Palestinian lawyers from within the occupied territories cannot represent their uh, clients because they cannot go into the prison. Many times they hire Israeli resident lawyers to go and visit with their clients who are held within Israel. Uh, even the prisoners that are brought to offer for a trial, they are, not, they are also uh, denied uh, the privilege of meeting with their lawyers ahead of time if they are Palestinians from the occupied territory. And, uh, uh, 
the numbers show that there are very, very, very little uh, full evidence hearings or full evidence trials for such uh, prisoners. Uh, in 2006, it was counted and it was shown that it was less than 1.5% of the cases get to a full evident, uh, evidence trial. Uh, and uh, beyond all that, uh, of course, this is a breach of international law which explicitly forbids the transfer of prisoners from the occupied territory to the occupying power. Um, so in these prisons, the company has supplied uh, an entire security system for the Ktsiot prison, prison and a central command room for the Megiddo prison and a security apparatus for the Damun prison. These prisons also hold, and it's important to note, about 200 administrative detainees. Administrative detainees are held for months and sometimes years without a, any uh, ch charge <laughs> or trial, of course. Uh, they don't have any release date or court date. They are completely without rights, and this is, of course, again, a grave violation of human rights. I'll just go to the last uh, piece of evidence we have about this company's complicity. Um, all of what we found so far was only about apparatus. And we somewhat assumed that after what happened in 2004, the company have decided not to supply actual services, security services in the territories, but we were wrong. And uh, we've been working with Danwatch, a Danish uh, uh, group, uh, to expose their complicity in actual providence of security services in the settlements, just like they did before. Um, this is a, a wanted ad for uh, guards in supermarkets in the occupied territories in settlements, uh, in Malé, Dumim, and Haradar, two settlements. Uh, activists of Dunwatch have actually walked around the settlements and took pictures in supermarkets this one is from East Jerusalem, Ramat Shlomo. There are also pictures from um, uh, Malé Domim, another big settlement, uh, of guards that guard the supermarkets. They are not guarding the perimeter of the settlement, but they are providing security services within the settlement. We also uh, came upon this nice document, which is an uh, um, invoice uh, of the company uh, to supply uh, guard services in a cafe uh, in Maale Domim, which is the biggest uh, settlement, as you know. Uh, what's striking about this uh, proposal is that it uh, lists its services in the area as services given in Greater Jerusalem. So now we know the company's euphemism for these settlements. This is not part of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is big enough, but this is out of Jerusalem. Uh, this is a settlement Ma'ale Domi. Finally, uh, we have contacted the company several times asking for their response. We've received no response, but the Russell Tribunal did receive a letter from the company and I want to read it to you because I think there are striking uh, differences from the first response that I've read before. So this is a letter to the Russell Commission. Uh, dear Russell Commission, this is our statement in response to your invitation to take part in the Commission's proceedings this weekend. The Middle East peace process is at a delicate stage. <laughs> it is. <laughs> we believe it should be left to the principles involved to try to make progress. We do not believe this weekend's hearings of the Russell Tribunal on Palestine well intentions as they no doubt are, <laughs> will help this process. We have therefore decided not to engage with the tribunal or respond to the statement it, it has made to the media, except to state that G4S seeks to enhance security worldwide by offering high quality services to commercial organizations, individuals, and governments. Our policy is always to comply with national law in any jurisdiction in which we operate. Regards, Michael Clark, Public Affairs Director, G4S PLC. So I think the differences are striking from the first announcement by the company. Um, let me just conclude with two requests to the tribunal. Uh, the first, I think, would be for us to 
appeal to the governments. The governments are the big clients of this company. Uh, this company is responsible or it got uh, a lot of business in the privatization of prisons worldwide, including here in the UK and in South Africa. Uh, this country obviously doesn't care much about its uh, public uh, uh, standing, <laughs> um, but they do care about governments. And in the past, uh, this was deliberated in the Danish parliament, and this is what produced uh, the previous response by the company. So it's important to appeal to the British government and the Danish government regarding this company. Our second request, and this is just an idea to be considered by the tribunal, is to consider dedicating a whole tribunal on Palestine to the question of political prisoners and their uh, conditions in Palestine and Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we do have a question from Juror Michael. Yes, part of it is a question, part of it is information. Uh, I think it may be of interest to the public and yourselves that I was part of a delegation 18 months ago that looked at the military court system in Israel. And uh, we are producing an update, and it will endorse everything you've said, uh, about condition of the process which we will submit is not judicial that leads to people being locked up in the conditions you've described. And that is due to be published in the spring of next year. That's just a point of information. But there is, um, I, I'm interested in the two requests you make. I'm also interested that they're, they're twofold, obviously government um, approaches uh, and also dedicating the tribunal. I, I understand that. But there is a third angle on this, and that is bringing suits civil suits in the United Kingdom against G4 for obvious violations. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to do that, uh, you've given us some information on what they're doing at the moment, irrespective of what they say in various letters. One of the objectives would be to identify an English director. Is there an English director? You mentioned there were three, but I don't think you mentioned the English one. From what we know, because this is, a, it's a private company, it doesn't, uh, the Israeli branch is a private company, it doesn't have to dec disclose its, uh, uh, all of its board or anything, but uh, the three directors that we know of, uh, one is Danish, one is uh, uh, Greek, and the third one is Israeli. So it's, they may, any of them may have uh, British citizenship, and that's worth uh, checking, but from the, the prelim preliminary uh, investigation that we had, this, these are the three directors of the company. Well, a second question you may be able to help with or not. In, in your researches, a company like this would have to make a policy statement at some point, uh, either at the initiation of the company or when they uh, engage in contracts in the United Kingdom for prison services which they provide as to what their objectives and policy, policy directives are. Have you seen any such document? Yes, the company has these, uh, these documents on its website, both the international company and the Israeli one, and they both claim that they comply with international law. And that's all they say? Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, uh, I have a question, um, I, even though I know that um, yes, I have we're right on time, a little past time. Okay. Um, I was looking at that um, full body scanner. Now, uh, it's all the rage in the United States right now because uh, people don't want all of their private parts just, you know, displayed. And in fact, what has happened is some private parts have been, um, uh, well, yeah, they're, they're exposed, and they're exposed, um, you know. So now, the, the question I have, is that the same machine or a similar machine? Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same machine. It's the same provider. L3 Communications is an American corporation that produces them. The machine is called Safe View, which makes you feel maybe it's safe. But you have to remember that in the occupied territories, maybe people have to cross checkpoints maybe twice a day to work and back, to school and back, 
and cross that machine twice a day. So with all the concerns about privacy and showing private body parts, I would also ask about the safety of this apparatus. So the, the company name is L3 Communi L3 Communications, yes. Communications. It's a public uh, 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 U.S. company. And uh, also uh, there is a concern for radiation. Yes. And that means that even the young children are going. We don't have any information about that, but I, haven't, I, don't, I just know that this is called safe view, which makes me worried. And then the final question I have is the relationship of Michael Chertoff, who is the former Department of Homeland Security um, Secretary in the United States, to this company. We need to check that. I've been told yeah. that he <laughs> has a interest in the company that provides mm. the scanners at U.S. airports, and if these are the same uh, we'll scanners. Mm. We'll have to check that. Please. please check that for me. <laughs> okay. There's one more. I'm, I'm so sorry. I've been asked to ask this question. So, so. Um, but it's very important in terms of the UK. You indicated that the Israeli company is 90% owned by Danish British. Mm -hmm. Do you know the split? Yes, it's 90.5% owned by the British Danish Corporation, G G4 Securo, Securi Corp. Securi Corp, yeah. Yes, yeah, Securi Corp. And uh, the rest of the percentage is, is privately held by Egal Schermeister, who is the CEO, the Israeli CEO and the original founder of Hashmira. And do you know, uh, with regard to the 90.5, how much of that can be attributed to the British angle as opposed to the Danish? No, this was, this was merged. It's one company. Yes, I appreciate It's not that. a partnership. It's a British-Danish company, and it's dually traded in, in the UK and in Denmark. All right, thank you very much. I would like to thank the witnesses very much for your testimony. I'd like to thank the audience for your attention. And um, I think uh, it's time for me to pass the microphone over to the person who's going to adjourn us for lunch. And um, this is a particularly interesting aspect, as I don't know what is happening in uh, the UK and in Europe, but as the police state tightens in the United States, um, security corporations and of course the war machine, those corporations that constitute the war machine are rolling and they're rolling strong. So this testimony is particularly interesting to me and I'm sure will be impactful on all of us as we consider the state of our democracy the, um, and the security apparatus that rolls as a result of the war industry and the wars. So our first um, uh, witness is John Hillary and I would like to invite Mr. Hillary to come to the stand. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, it's a great pleasure and a privilege for War and Want to be able to address this tribunal here today. Um, War and Want has been very actively involved in exposing corporate complicity in Israel's crimes against the Palestinian people and other people of the region in the last five years. In 2006, we published a report called Profiting from the Occupation, which was subtitled Corporate Complicity in Israel's Crimes Against the Palestinian People, which is almost word for word what this tribunal is meant to be looking at. And I have a copy to be able to give to each of the jurors um, to share. Um, our most recent report, I believe, was, was shared with you yesterday called Boycott, Divestment, Sanctions. We have a copy for each of the jurors one by one. So if I may hand one to, to pass to the left. Um, this is, um, again, germane to today's discussions but also goes further because it responds to the call from Palestinian civil society to mount a global campaign of boycott, 
divestment and sanctions against Israel until it complies with international law. And War on Want, we work very closely with our partners in Palestine who have made that call. And before I start my testimony today, I just want to draw attention to the fact Take your seat, please. Asseyez-vous. Merci. Et cette, Voilà, uh, this session will uh, have a thematic the security industry and the war industry, and uh, the jury will be chaired by uh, Cyn Cynthia McKinney. Cynthia and Cyn 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 McGuire, we will jointly uh, co-chair this session and that's, the next session too. That's very good. Thank you. Women are more circular than men. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't have the. Uh... Okay. I don't have my. Um. Is John Hillary here? Oh, well, what's the name of this? I am looking for the schedule. Yes, in this section, we will actually, it's, um, In this section, we are looking at uh, okay, the security industry and the war industry. That one of our partners, Stop the Wall, the grassroots anti-apartheid movement in Palestine, their representative, Jamal Juma, has been denied access to come here today to be able to give evidence to this tribunal. He has been denied that access by the Israelis who locked him up without charge for three months earlier on this year. So I think we need to put on record for this tribunal that the evidence that you will hear today is made the poorer by the absence of Palestinians who have been pre 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 um, uh, precluded. precluded indeed yes. from coming here today. My, the focus of my um, testimony is on the military industry, the arms trade, and the security apparatus. And as the chair has already indicated, there can be no more obvious example of direct involvement in the violation of human rights and the violation of international humanitarian law. And Israel is obviously one of the most heavily militarized countries on earth. Israel spends between 7 and 9 percent of its GDP every year on the military. This is far and away higher than any other OECD country. The USA, which we consider to be a highly militarized society, spends only 4 percent in comparison. Britain and France, 2.5 percent. Germany, 1.5 percent. So you can see that um, Israel is heavily militarized as a society. In 2009, the Israeli state spent 13.5 billion US dollars on military expenditure, including two and a half billion from the US itself in military aid. And also, although I cannot touch on it in this, in this presentation, we know that Israel is the only state in the Middle East to have its own nuclear arsenal. 
And so when we're thinking about corporate complicity, although we do not know any of the details of how big that arsenal is or who has helped in its creation, I feel we need again to put on the record that behind all of the talk here is a nuclear capability which is truly frightening for the whole region. Also by way of context, we tend to speak in terms of exports and imports of arms. War on Want is one of the organizations involved calling for a two-way arms embargo. We helped found a group called Stop Arming Israel, calling for a two-way arms embargo. And that highlights the fact of where they currently exist in the market. But I can focus on one particular item, which Israeli companies have claimed almost as their own. And these are the unmanned aerial vehicles, the UAVs, which we commonly perhaps know as drones. And drones being used in more and more of the conflicts around the world. We think of them in Pakistan, responsible for numerous civilian casualties there, and have become part of what we would see as the most indiscriminate weaponry. Studies have shown that when you use these unmanned aerial vehicles, which are remote control from miles and miles and miles away, they have a kill ratio to collateral damage ratio, if you'll excuse the horrific parlance, um, of 1 to 10. That means for every one of the people you're targeting to kill with one of these drones, you are likely to kill 10 civilians at the same time. And they are therefore one of the most damaging and most indiscriminate forms of weaponry. They are one of the forms of weaponry which Israeli companies have developed in their use in terms of, of, of the operations in Gaza, in Lebanon in 2006, and also in other operations around the region. We think also of the Israeli air attacks on Syria in 2007. And Elbit has developed its own armory of these different UAVs. The British Army itself has contracted Elbit and its partner company, Thales UK, in a contract worth over $1 billion to develop the next generation of our own British drones, the Watchkeeper drones. And Elbert and Thales are working in a joint venture called UTAX, and the British company UAV Engines Limited will produce the plane's engines. But just as you think you're beginning to get the understanding of different parts of these planes being produced by different countries' arms industry, Elbit is in fact the whole owner of the British company UAV Engines Limited. So you have this circular spiral, this complex web I was referring to earlier of different companies from different countries which are still all interconnected. The French arms company Sagem has also signed in for a joint venture with Elbit to produce UAVs. And again, the French drones, the French UAVs, that this is not the case as it is perhaps with Burma or Colombia, where you are trying to stop arms exports to the country, but that actually Israel has its own highly developed arms industry. And indeed that the Israeli companies who are involved in the production of military materiel are very highly developed and connected in the global arms sector. And it's a very complex web of corporate complicity where you have one fighter plane which will be equipped by many different companies providing different components and different systems. It will be carrying different missiles which again have been made by three or four or five different companies and all of them are interconnected. Many of them exist as subsidiaries of each other. So it's a very rich and complex web of complicity that we're talking about here. And that means on the one hand, I will only be able to touch on the very, very top, top level of this, and I know I'm going to be supported by presentations to come. But on the other hand, it is an extremely important part of the global movement of trying to find out which companies are complicit in Israel's crimes, because it then gives a much greater sense of following up on that with action thereafter. So, just to take the top points of this sector, Israel has a very developed military sector, as I have said. It's a key part of its economy, responsible for over $6 billion in sales in 2009 alone. And the, the biggest companies have become world players. 
Elbit, a vast private company now within Israel, um, has subsidiaries in the UK, Austria, the USA, Brazil, Germany, etc., etc. I will not presume to take too much of your time on Elbit because I know that there is a separate presentation on Elbit coming up immediately afterwards. Raphael is another of the biggest Israeli companies, again with a huge order catalog across the world. It has apparently $3 billion in orders, which it's still trying to honor to, to its foreign um, customers. And then the two state-owned giants, Israel Military Industries, which is responsible for having developed the Uzi submachine gun, and the Israel Aerospace Industries. These companies occupy the high technology end of the market. And again, I cannot begin to give you a sense of the full breadth